What's up, everybody? This is Mason back for another founder interview. Today we have Ivan Wright on, the founder and CEO of um, MoonPay. Um, it's a basically a payment infrastructure to make cryptocurrencies available to everyone. So let's bring him on and learn more about MoonPay. Hey, Mason, how are we doing? Thanks for joining us, man. Um, appreciate you taking the time to come on. Uh, before we dive into your personal story uh, to MoonPay, can you just explain at a very fundamental level, what is cryptocurrency before we try to understand what your business is? Yeah, so big question, what is cryptocurrency? Uh, it's a new form of money. Um, really the idea behind cryptocurrency, probably um, we can trace it back to Bitcoin. Um, there are obviously some versions before that, um, but really Bitcoin is an alternative store of value. Um, it was created by an anonymous founder, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. But really the premise is it's completely decentralized. Um, so it's not one particular person or anything that any, any source of central uh, authority that could shut it down. Um, so that is its premise. But beyond that, there are a lot of really interesting use cases for cryptocurrency. Um, you also have not just Bitcoin, but things called stable coins. So you may have heard we're on Facebook today, Facebook is thinking about a stable cryptocurrency called Libra. Uh, there are other uh, stable forms of cryptocurrency, but essentially the idea is almost anything can become tokenized. And so cryptocurrencies can have lots of really interesting use cases. Great. So give us a bit of your background and how you got into um, MoonPay and from the financial side of things. Yeah, so I started my career uh, on the institutional side uh, doing portfolio construction at a company called Reddington in London. Uh, essentially my job was post-financial crisis in 2007, 2008. Um, you know, a lot of these pension funds were super underfunded and they needed to get back on track. So my role uh, at Reddington was to help these pension funds invest across a number of different asset classes. So I got a good understanding from like the institutional level, how kind of these managers allocate uh, to these different asset classes. And that point was, uh, you know, in 2012, when I was graduating college, uh, I was at George Washington, D.C. My good friend had wrote his thesis on Bitcoin. That's when I first kind of discovered it. Um, and I also, you know, I guess when I was working at Reddington, I, I thought about it as this is an interesting alternative asset class, right? Uh, the last kind of new asset class before Bitcoin um, was probably hedge funds. Uh, but what's interesting about that was it was mainly institutional investors. It wasn't open to kind of retail uh, everyone in the everyday public. Whereas with cryptocurrency, it's a movement that really started with retail. Um, and now, you know, as it's kind of started to mature, we can start to look at it as more of an institutional asset class. But that's kind of where I started my career um, was, was Reddington. And, you know, ultimately, I knew that, you know, I caught the technology bug when I was in London. Uh, there were these really cool applications that were being built. Um, most of them were around FX. So companies like TransferWise, companies like Revolut. Uh, that made it easy for people to exchange their currencies uh, more effectively. Um, I got interested in trying to solve a problem first around savings. So my first startup I set up in 2015, uh, which was an automated savings platform. The idea was you could connect your bank account uh, and move your money into a savings account. Um, you know, didn't have the best traction. It was quite hard to acquire customers. Um, you know, it was a retail product. I was hoping that we launched something and we would you know, have tons of new users coming on, but it was, it was quite tricky. Um, so ultimately decided to sell that business, um, but in, in 2017, it was impossible to ignore uh, what was happening in cryptocurrency. And it was kind of then where I said, I got to get involved, you know, I got to take my skills around fintech and start to build stuff. So I started to experiment, had a bunch of different ideas, um, different projects I was kind of messing around with. And ultimately, I saw that there was this big problem um, for people to get into cryptocurrency easily. Um, you had these exchanges, obviously the big exchanges like Coinbase or Binance or kind of household names now. Um, but for uh, a lot of people, you know, getting their first cryptocurrency was still quite tricky. Um, and it was kind of by chance. Um, but someone uh, reached out to me from Bitcoin.com uh, and they were having some issues, um, you know, trying to enable their customers to buy cryptocurrency more effectively. Uh, and that's ultimately where MoonPay was born. We tried to build a solution to enable um, existing companies to um, allow their users to buy cryptocurrencies more easily. So 
you know, we started this business early 2018 is when we first, uh, you know, came up with the idea. Early 2019 is when we launched uh, with Bitcoin.com in Europe and UK. And then fast forward today, uh, we're almost, I think at the end of this month, we'll be close to 100 uh, integrations across leading exchanges, wallets, websites. And ultimately what we're trying to do is just make it really easy for end users to onboard um, because it's quite complex. There are many different steps if you're trying to get your first cryptocurrency. You know, you obviously need to control with the, you need to have your payments component, right? So you gotta be able to pay. And today, the most common way to pay is most people have their debit and credit card in their pocket, right? So we wanted to offer, you know, an easy way for people to buy with their debit and credit card. Um, but because cryptocurrency is highly regulated, we also have to do KYC. Uh, so we need to do know your customer, uh, which means either scanning the customer's face, doing a selfie, uh, and also doing a photo of uh, their identity uh, documents to, to basically onboard. So there's a whole process that goes, and then you have fraud, which is a really you know, big problem in cryptocurrency. A lot of people, uh, because it's irreversible, if you actually spend your cryptocurrency, uh, sorry, spend with your, strike your card, you can't get, we can't get the money back because we've delivered the cryptocurrency. So that's another you know, key challenge that we need to solve for. But today, it's super exciting. Uh, we've seen a lot of growth. And uh, you know, we're really trying to think about enabling people um, to have more use cases out of their cryptocurrency. And my prediction is more and more applications are going to need this very essential infrastructure. Great. Well, so I want to take people back, because when we met, you were selling Lamborghinis. And I want you to explain that. We're going to bring up an image here. but. Maybe this will give some light into the name MoonPay, and you can explain, you know, what what you're doing. Yeah. So that was really funny. That was the Star Wars premiere, uh, and that was uh, end of 2018. And uh, really, you know, one of the big concepts uh, in, uh, in in crypto is this idea of like going to the moon. So it, it's kind of a joke. It was a meme. Uh, people would talk about moon, uh, and once they got to the moon, they would have their Lamborghini. So uh, my co-founder and I, Victor, um, decided to throw up a website uh, where people could buy uh, Lamborghinis uh, with Bitcoin. Um, but the reality is, like, you know, there, when when Bitcoin crashed in 2017, we didn't have a lot of buyers, but it was really more of a fun and spirit project. Yeah. Uh, that we launched over a week highlight of uh, something that we did that was that was super fun, but uh, we we love the name Moon, so that's kind of where that translated into our new product. Moon. Gotcha. So how much? Um, this seems like a highly regulated industry. Um, what do you see like looking forward? Um, how does how do you guys really become an established? Like obviously, you guys are leveraged on cryptocurrency being more adopted by the general public. Mm -hmm. um, by retailers, by anybody who is who's trying to transact anything of value, um, how do you see that on the on the go forward from adoption and from regulation? So to understand the more question, it's it's like what are the barriers to adoption? Or yeah, like well, what's keeping somebody like some of the questions we're getting right now are uh, they tuned in late? You guys got to show up on time, but they're saying like, what is crypto? currency how do right. you it sounds like to me my understanding is you've gotten a lot of early adopters how does yes. crypto you know cross the the barrier to being an everyday form of currency and obviously then you know helping companies like yourself and others who are trying to solve issues within crypto so ultimately i think it all comes down to having good use cases right there needs to be a reason that we should use this new currency um, so I guess one of the premises of Bitcoin is it's um, what I didn't mention before. That's a key use case is it's finite, right? There's only 21 million in supply. Um, so you know people see Bitcoin as maybe a, a version of gold, um, and some people see it as a hedge, right? Um, you have an environment, especially today, where you have the Federal Reserve uh, printing you know a trillion dollars of cash inflowing to the system. Um, you know some people might see um, you know there there could be an alternative solution through Bitcoin. Um, but I think for merchants and merchant adoption, you know, the, the problem is, you know, it needs to have, uh, you know, if you're a merchant, you can't accept something that's highly volatile, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the immediate use case of, of cryptocurrencies that makes a lot of sense to me is around stable coins, um, right? Because um, essentially you're able to use this new technology that's really easy to move value from A to B, uh, that's much cheaper, that's much more cost effective, that's borderless, you don't need a bank account. Uh, to interact with cryptocurrency, um, and and so I think 
you know, we need to, to make sure that the cryptocurrency is actually solving a problem. Um, and so that's where I've, I've spent the most time kind of really trying to focus on the applications and building with those applications, enabling everyday people to interact with cryptocurrency. And maybe a good example is that, of that was uh, this weekend. It was kind of cool. Um, the uh, a protocol that we're working with, uh, it's called MakerDAO. Uh, they have a stable currency called DAI. Uh, that's uh, you know, essentially their version of a stable currency. And uh, there was a, a charity event uh, going on. Um, it was uh, Paolo Dybala uh, versus a, another German player. Uh, essentially, were doing a live stream, and they wanted to raise money for the Argentinian Red Cross. And one of the problems they had was it wasn't easy to immediately set up a solution for the Argentinian Red Cross to accept donations. Um, so what we built was uh, a widget uh, where people could put in their debit and credit card. It would automatically buy this new cryptocurrency called DAI, uh, and it would be sent directly to the Argentinian Red Cross. So they didn't need to have a bank account. Uh, they could get this set up. We set this up in less than a day. Uh, and it was you know, much cheaper um, than some of the traditional donation platforms. Um, so that, to me, is like a, a really interesting use case, I think, um, for cross-border remittances. Uh, we're definitely going to see a lot of value out of that. People that, you know, in the United States, we're super fortunate. We have a currency uh, that people trust that works, right? But in other countries, you know, they don't necessarily have those options. So cryptocurrency can add real value uh, to those people's lives where, you know, they don't necessarily need to have a bank account. There are many people that are underbanked, right? Um, so, you know, those are the areas that I think are going to be the most interesting. Um, can talk a lot about other cool use cases, but that, that's the one I wanted to focus on. To the point of stable coins, has the Fed or our government recognized crypto and created a stable <sighs> coin for our country? Yeah, it's interesting. So China um, has been a little bit ahead of the curve there um, in terms of launching. Uh, you know, they're, they're doing a digital renminbi uh, currency uh, that's you know in the progress of the process of actually being launched. I think it was just recently launched. Um, I think it's inevitable that governments will eventually launch their own cryptocurrencies. And the reason why is everything is also, um, one, it's just a more efficient technology um, to move money from A to B. Uh, it's much easier to issue to people, especially in a crisis like this. Um, being able to deposit like a stimulus check immediately into a cryptocurrency wallet is much more efficient than going through banks. So I think it's a matter of time until they adopt. Also from like a taxation perspective, um, you know, you can track all the movements. So originally, there was this idea of anonymity. I think that will continue to be important. Um, but um, you know, the technology makes it much. It's it's a much more efficient way um, to be handling and, and moving money. So I think it's just a matter of time until uh, governments take it up. So I, I want to keep it focused on MoonPay because I think it's easy when when yeah. a lot of us don't understand crypto to ask about that. We had a player in the NBA. I don't know him at all, but um, Spencer Dinwiddie. I think proposed tokenizing his NBA contract. Um, if he calls up, a, you know, obviously there's there's the league to deal with, which is uh, the final say. But like, would MoonPay be able to help him do that? Right. Well, not not today. Uh, so really, what's interesting about what Spencer was trying to do was, from my understanding, uh, he was you know given a contract where he's being paid over a number of years. Uh, and he wanted to essentially get some of that money up front, unlock that capital up front. Uh, and so he was taking the idea of trying to tokenize his contract. So the thing is, his contract was more of a security. And so it's important that different cryptocurrencies can be classified as different things. Um, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum today are, are, are not um, defined as securities. Um, but when it's a security, that obviously requires it to go through regulation. Uh, we have securities laws in the United States. You know, there's a, there's a process to registering a security. Um, so, you know, we can't just tokenize everything right now because of existing securities laws. But it, what's interesting is, um, you know, it's a way, you know, what we saw back in 2017, uh, kind of in this ICO uh, market, uh, where people were creating their own cryptocurrencies to represent a lot of different things. Uh, and some of those were scams, some of those were not, um, you know, actually adopted, they, they weren't actually really solving a problem. But the big problem with a lot of them was they were actually acting more like securities, right? They were raising money for something. Uh, you know, in, in the case of Spencer uh, and his contract, um, I think security tokens will be a thing, but the problem is you have to uh, issue them. You, have, you can only have accredited investors participate. So that's a very small audience, right? Um, that's yeah. able to access those. Whereas utility tokens um, today can be accessed by anyone, right? They don't necessarily have to uh, be an accredited investor um, to get exposure to a, a crypto asset. 
Gotcha. So you, it would have been nice to do that and get the money on the front end because I think we're going to lose some of our salary here this year, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see with the question. One day, is there transaction fees with MoonPay? Yes. So we have a transaction fee for debit and credit cards today. Um, that obviously varies on the platform that we work with. Um, we're always trying to offer lower fees, and that's a function of uh, the amount of volume that we're doing. So the more volume that we do, the cheaper fees that we can offer uh, across our network of clients. Um, but you know, once you're in cryptocurrency, transaction fees are, are pretty negligible. Um, you know, obviously with some currencies like Bitcoin, you know, one of the problems comes around scalability. Um, it becomes more expensive to move you know, Bitcoin uh, around as it becomes more popular. And there are a bunch of people working on uh, solutions that can solve that. Um, but for a lot of other cryptocurrencies, it's super cheap. Um, to, to move from, from A to B. So that's where there's a lot of value for remittances. A really fun fact is if you want to move a billion dollars of Bitcoin, guess how much that costs in transaction fees? How much? Uh, $80. Wow. So you can see there's incredible efficiency um, you know, with moving large sums of money uh, versus the traditional banking system. The thing is what we needed to solve with MoonPay was today, um, you know, the best analogy I can use is you have Skype, right? Or you have, I guess we're on a video call right now. We're using internet uh, to communicate. We're using voice over IP, right? Uh, that was revolutionary technology. Before we used to use landlines and phones. Um, Skype realized this and they built in backwards compatibility, right? You can still make calls to people's uh, landlines and phones. And the way I see cryptocurrencies is, you know, this is a much more efficient network for moving value, moving money. Um, but we need to have the backwards compatibility to appeal to a mainstream audience. We need to get people into crypto. So what we've built is those rails. So first we started with debit and credit cards. That was kind of the low hanging fruit. It's still expensive. It's still, there's a lot of inefficiency using debit and credit cards. Then a step up is bank accounts. Um, you know, but the, the challenge is bank accounts uh, can be slow, right? And then from there, we'll move into crypto to crypto transactions. But we needed to solve, um, you know, having that backwards compatibility with um, the things that are in everyone's pocket, so we can get more people into using cryptocurrency. Gotcha. To to your earlier point of, of viewing crypto as um, initially, uh, people used it for the anonymity, or it was being affiliated with Silk Road, or or buying things like like drugs and arms and um, kind of more shady stuff. Is there like a, a marketing yeah. effort or an education to the consumer around its its capability today and that it's not necessarily for for shady dealings or is anybody like at the forefront of that um, education? Yeah, so I think with any new technology, um, it, a lot of them will see adoption in dark markets first. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that was what we saw with the internet and that kind of played out again when it came to cryptocurrencies and, and some of the use cases that we saw. Um, you know, ultimately, I think you know, transaction value that's being used for illicit purposes is far below 1% today. Uh, so that number has dramatically reduced. Um, and, and part of the reason is there's also really sophisticated tracking tools. There's things called chain analysis where you can track on chain uh, where the money has moved. Um, so you know, I think there's less and less uh, illicit activity happening uh, on cryptocurrency. But if you also think about it in terms of fiat money, right, there's still tons of, if you think about it, if we're building an alternative form of money, today we have tons of illicit transactions that happen through US dollars or euros or pounds or, or all these types of money. So it, you know, it was inevitable that it was going to happen inside of cryptocurrency. Um, I think we're moving to an environment where it's becoming safer, it's becoming more regulated, um, which I think is all a good thing to promote uh, more mainstream adoption. Um, I think you know, the governments are, are really trying to set rules and regulations um, around companies um, and, and, and giving them kind of guidelines around how they should be participating because it is a serious thing, obviously, when uh, you're, you're moving money. But there's always a balance there because you don't want to create too much friction where you dilute uh, the experience. Gotcha. We have a question from the audience, Jason Littlepage. Who are your customers? Is there a typical individual or, or industry that's making use of MoonPay? Yeah, uh, so you know we have a wide variety of customers. So we've got two. We're a B two B to C business, so we're doing business to business. So we work with a lot of the leading exchanges, wallets, uh, decentralized applications that just want a solution to onboard their users. 
Um, so there's that aspect of the business, and then there's the end users that are on those platforms, right? Um, so you know, a lot of the people that use MinPay for the first time are you know really first time users into crypto. Um, you know, we power places like Bitcoin.com. So if you go to Bitcoin.com today uh, and you go to the website to buy with buy some Bitcoin, uh, we're powering um, that that experience. Uh, under the hood. So a lot of them are, are kind of first time users, um, you know, just getting their hands on cryptocurrency. I would say we're not really tailored to the more sophisticated audience, like the professional traders. Uh, they're obviously, you know, exchange you know, much more sophisticated tools for people that are trying to make bets or speculate on cryptocurrency. I think for us, it's a lot of people are starting to experiment with wallets. We're starting to see a lot of activity on wallets. So now you can download a, a number of different uh, wallets that you can use for all sorts of different purposes. So you can send money, you could download a cryptocurrency wallet and I could send you money uh, instantly. So some people will use MoonPay to top up their wallet and then send it on frictionlessly without uh, a ton of fees and able to move money very, very quickly. Gotcha. So can you uh, um, share with us how you've, you're, you're the founder of MoonPay. Um, you know, I've talked to other investors who are really interested in what you're doing, people who have invested in it you've now leveraged this to start a crypto fund called Hodl. Can you share a bit about managing both of those and, and what Hodl is looking to take advantage of? Right. So it's not, I would say crypto is an aspect of our fund. We're really looking at emerging technology as a theme. Okay. Um, you know, really with Hodl, um, what's interesting on the MoonPay side, they're, they're completely separate. Um, but MoonPay, obviously, I get to meet a lot of really interesting founders um, that are trying to solve um, challenges in the space. And I learned so much Kind of working with founders, um, so you know, I try to do a couple calls every week, um, learning about other people's businesses and where it makes sense. Um, you know, we like to participate. Uh, one of the companies that you know we you know we've been really excited about that we've been looking at is in the esports um, sector. It's a professional sports um, league called uh, it's a gaming team called Phase Clan, and uh, with that, um, what's been really exciting is um, they're starting to look at um, use cases around cryptocurrency. Um, so. Yeah, you know, there's definitely, um, you know, we, we always try to find companies where there's synergy with, you know, applications that can promote and, and get more people uh, aware around, you know, the use cases around crypto. Off this, I think Face Clan just did a forty million dollars Series A. Is yep. that right? That made um, that was just public. My teammate Jamal Murray, I think, was involved as well as Myers Leonard. So those guys, they are two gamers that know what they're doing. So it must be a good deal um, if all three of you guys are in it. Um, maybe they won't appreciate me sharing that, but I saw it on a newsletter, so it's public information anyway. Uh, give us a, you know, we have a lot of our founders share stories that um, that are just out there or from their experience, they just never um, imagined would happen. Do you have anything in, in your founding of MoonPay that, that you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, I mean, it, it. You know, there's definitely. It's not an easy thing to decide to start a company. Uh, it's always really challenging. Um, I think, you know, you you really just have to be resilient uh, and try and try again. Um, you know, with my first business, um, you know, ultimately, I, I think uh, I built something that was really cool in my mind, but it was very hard. Uh, you know, it wasn't like overnight people were going to start using our application and and, and finding it. Uh, the build it and, and they will come, uh, you know, rarely becomes true. So I think it all comes down to making sure that you're solving real problems. Um, and uh, if you can build a business, one piece of advice I have is if you can build a business where there's already a ready-made customer uh, that's going to use your service, um, it cuts out a lot of the assumptions, right? Uh, I think one of the big mistakes a lot of people make is they have a great idea and then they think if they build that idea, they're going to have a lot of new people uh, coming and using that service. Whereas if you can solve a problem for someone and you can build a solution that's actually solving that problem, uh, it becomes much easier because they tell you what they need, what they, and you can learn from them. And I think, you know, that's been one of the biggest advantages we've had with MoonPay is, you know, our roadmap, we're constantly adding new features. Um, and a lot of it is driven by, you know, listening to our customers and, and getting their active feedback. So the quicker you can get into that feedback loop, I think the better chance that you have to, to succeed. Awesome. Very cool. Well, we'll, we'll definitely chalk that up to the advice to it to the founders that are tuning in. Um, Ivan, just want to thank you so much for coming on. Uh, wish you all the best with MoonPay. Excited to see where it goes and uh, appreciate you taking the time. No problem. Thanks, man. Take it easy. Thanks.